Now I'm self-conscious about the, <laughs> the camera issue. I will fix that. Um, but so today we'll be much more, um, we'll have a conversation about, let me just get my PowerPoint going here about your concerns related to getting your class going. Uh, I think there's some good tips on here too, just in terms of thinking about, um, just in general issues related to canvas and how to, uh, get your class, um, looking better for winter quarter. I, I'm always saying that everything, whether it's Zoom or Canvas, in fact, just now there have been quite a few uh, quite a few Zoom changes that have happened and not as many, but some um, Canvas changes as well, even as late as last couple days ago, because someone was asking me about a multi-tool and I said multi-tool and I guess Trevor had sent a message out in the last day or so about a multi-tool. So it shows you how quickly some of this stuff uh, changes. So it's just, a, I think, a good reminder that we have to always stay on top of the technology and the new features and, and so forth. So um, so kind of some assumptions for this is, and again, not all of you fall into this, so wherever you fall is, is fine. But um, you know, one assumption is that if you're brand new, and I've um, talked to a few instructors who literally are just like, how do I do this? How do I get my class going? Um, you've taught it before in another modality. So you have notes, you have handouts, you have slides, uh, PowerPoints. How do you translate that into Canvas? And I think one person was saying recently to me that it's not as like, you can't just tell Canvas, take a folder of all my files and turn it into a class. It It's not the case. Um, and even when you have a class provided like Solange, someone gave you a class, you, know, you always have to tweak it. Um, anytime someone's given me a class, whether it's, I remember when I first started teaching at LTCC in the Pleist, late Pleistocene 1998, I came in and I... Um, I had just been hired like in August. It was a really late hire. So I got in and they said, here, are you teaching these classes and here are these books you're using. And I was kind of flabbergasted because I said, these are the books I'm supposed to teach with. They were very, not to get into it, but they were just not my style of, of text. And and the, the last person who had retired just taught it in a different way. So I struggled with that for the whole quarter because I had to teach books that really didn't complement my style or my training and so forth. So obviously, second point is we want to do a top-notch job in our Canvas class. We want our students to have great experience. Um, this is something I think a lot of us realize. If you're teaching a new prep, a new class, you may not have 100% of your work done by week one. That's fine. You know, you can use that great feature in Canvas of publish and unpublish on your modules so that if your midterm's not done or you don't have week three lectures or readings done or videos, you can hide all that stuff and let your students know um, we'll get to this, you know, in a week. But you just can't forget. I've done that where I'm like, oh, crap, I I didn't do week three video. It happened to me last quarter. And I was like, oh, I got to go on there and do it. And so it happens to all of us. But um, definitely think about pacing yourself throughout the quarter. Um, you'd like to use your time effectively to create a great class, but you don't want to do everything under the sun in terms of technology, Canvas features, or even class content. And that's one of the key decisions I think we make is what we should use in Canvas and what we shouldn't. And even if you're not teaching, you know, if you're running meetings or if you're doing like I was thinking about the holiday party, which was great. If you have um, live performers, you know, making sure like with your Zoom settings or the audio settings that everything is ready to go, you know, so there's a lot we can do with our Canvas, with our Zoom that prepares us and our participants for whatever is, is coming. Um, now, the last point is you might feel like you have no one to turn to, but of course, um, me going forward and then Treva throughout this year, you know, we will be hiring um, that position. Treva will be going back to teaching in the business department. So, but we thank her for all the work she's done. Um, by the way, there's another video out there in training called Teaching the Basics. And this was on the request of Brad Deeds, our Dean of Instruction, who said he had some instructors he was going to hire and they just needed like basics of teaching, how to do a grade book how to think about um, class discipline, those kinds of issues. And so if you're interested in that, I really recommend that video. I've pulled a few resources from that video, but today's is more focused on, I don't want to say the the nuts and bolts, but more of, of like the nitty gritty of taking stuff from your computer, putting that into Canvas, figuring out how to use Zoom, figuring out if you need to use Labster. If you're teaching science, you might need to. 
if you're teaching audio production or video uh, film filmmaking, you're probably not going to use Lapster because it's for science experiments. So some of that will work through today. I also recommend the workshop and handouts on the syllabus, and I'll put those in the chat room, which disappeared, but I just got it back here. So I'll put that as well, that link, and that allows you to download a template for the syllabus and to get some additional information. And I, I really recommend that one because it has, a, I think, a lot of information, including information that other faculty provided in terms of helping out with um, their greatest tips for the syllabus. And there's that link again for Google Drive. So I'm basing it off this OmniGraphle diagram that was just my way of trying to think through the six steps or so in terms of getting your class up and running. So the, the first thing to think about here is just class modality. And I'm going to let Treva in here. And some of this is really, I'll, I'll show you some slides in a second here that I took directly from our winter spring schedule. And I know um, this morning we were talking about, you know, class modality and when things are changing. Some of this, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens in spring. I mean, the, the, the virus rollout, I heard if it takes as long as it takes initially, it'll take 10 years to um, get the entire U.S. vaccinated. So if that's the case, um, I suspect, you know, we have a new administration coming on board. You know, spring might still be, my, my guess is spring, most places would be um, online or hybrid at least, but, but who knows? So when we think about this, you know, it's really changed because as many of you know in the past, uh, Trev has been here a long time as I have, we used to do a lot more in-person instruction. We then started developing hybrid instruction, which became really useful to give some students opportunity to like in a psychology research methods class, work on a project online, and then come back for the um, uh, re refreshing, you know, in-person stuff that allows you to ask uh, questions and all that kind of stuff. Since COVID, of course, we've really moved. We didn't even have Eve before. We've moved into Eve and and DE with with some hybrid classes. The good news is, and this is uh, in no small part due to Trevor's efforts, you know, to get every class on campus a Canvas shell. We said for years, even our ISP, and I used my ISP. Canvas shell this last quarter for the grade book because the grade book is really great in Canvas. But um, the, the way that you interact or use Canvas and Zoom will vary with your modality. Again, if you're doing ISP, just because of security and privacy, you the st students in, in um, under incarceration do not have access to the internet. And so it's just Canvas is only used for the grade book. So if you look at my Canvas shell from fall from my SUSH 106, you just see the grade book and nothing else is built out because there's no interaction with students. So that's a rare exception. For DE, Canvas is really, what, close to 100% of your content and supplement that a bit with Zoom. With hybrid, in the past certainly, um, you know, we did hybrid and there was just, there was very little use of Zoom because you would use the in-person for that hybrid component as well as the Canvas shell. So some of this has shifted. And then in terms of DE, some of you may use Zoom. And I know Solange has asked in a couple of trainings, you know, can you use Zoom in DE? The answer is yes, but it's not required. Um, in an EVE class, I think, and we'll, we'll look at these, these pages next to explain some of this. In an EVE class, the idea is that you would use um, more Zoom, but it's it's kind of interesting down here. It says while you should plan to be available during the days and times listed, um, you know you may not use the full time set aside for synchronous digital learning. So, Trev and I, I think have both been hedging on if someone asks us, you know, do you need to have Eve and do the students have to have their cameras on? Do they have to participate? It's very gray and subjective. There isn't a real answer to this because part of that relates to just the realization that students have flexible schedules and variable schedules as do we. So it's kind of, you know, the best guess is to say when you teach an EVE class, you're using Zoom more than you likely use it in a DE. But I think about Larry Green, who teaches mathematics, and he was using Zoom before any of us were really that I can remember in our classes. So it's not the case that if you're teaching DE, you won't use some Zoom, but it's it's more optional in 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 those cases. Again, in the spring uh, schedule, they do talk about, it's interesting here, they're saying it's going to be reintroduced in 2021, but I think, Trev, is it your understanding that that's still like? Um, yeah, I just, I think that, <clears throat> didn't 
Jeff say at one time? I mean, they were going to call it like on March 9th or something or so. oh, okay. I mean, something. Well, wasn't it kind okay. of like or saying if I mean, if we were going to end up being, you know, if we're face to face or I mean, if we're actually coming back to campus. Right. Is that what you're kind of? Yeah, I I cuz the way I was reading the schedule it sounded like it was decided but maybe it it isn't. You know, it says it's Yeah. You are correct. I when I read read stuff, I felt like it yeah. was getting everybody really ready to be but if that the actual, you know, definitive answer, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I thought that, but okay. Jeff said something during that all faculty meeting that day. I thought Okay. Like, who knows? So many things have been okay. said back and forth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And don't blame me and Trevor when like Stephanie was asking in the Zoom workshop today about, you know, um, can you do pop quizzes and all this? And it's like, yeah, sort of. Again, there's not a definitive answer. Again, if you go to the um, description of what Eve is, it talks about high touch and so forth. But the institution has not defined how much high touch. Right. So it's like it's more high touch than D.E., but what's interesting is some D.E. classes can be as high touch as an Eve class. So I guess we just have to accept some of the um, ambiguity. But in any case, this just describes for our students the different modalities. And I think we're pretty familiar with it. I think it's good that the, the district has this in the schedule. I just think there's a little bit of overlap between what we consider, you know, DE and Eve once we get into using Zoom, because Zoom is, is synchronous typically, unless you maybe use your Zoom recordings and share those asynchronously. So um, yeah, so I guess for, for step one, at any point, you know, just stop me as you want to talk more about the technology or just bits here that are on this outline. So step one is um, thinking about your course content. So if you're brand new and someone says, you know, you have to teach this new class uh, and Trev and I have been working with, I think, a new psychology instructor. So she has a lot of questions up front. And that's fine, certainly. When people have questions, we try to answer those. But everyone has different needs. Everyone has different technology needs, different content needs in terms of the discipline and so forth. Some faculty might need more um, you know, help with figuring out the outline, the Title V outline, the textbook and readings, than the technology, whereas others might need more help with the technology. And for each of these, I tried to list resources out there. If you don't know, you can always, and that includes folks listening to this as a video, non-live version. If you don't know, um, contact me or Treva or your dean and we could, you know, help you out with that information. So when we talk about the Title V outline, this is what the Chancellor's Office has on record. Whenever we write a brand new class, it lists everything under the sun related to that class. This is our eLumen system, which is for new curriculum. I just created a new class um, in ethnic studies on Native Americans and I had to do all this. So it has a uh, class description. It has information about what degrees are fulfilled by the class. It has writing assignments and reading assignments. The student learning outcomes and course objectives are really key. These are the key things you have to get. So if you're teaching a film production class, one of your objectives might be students have to create their own mini film by the end of the class. So having those objectives and this, which is the topical outline, um, and I remember years ago getting hazed in a curriculum committee meeting because I had too long of an outline, but I literally wrote this outline like in 1998 and haven't changed the topical areas since then. Um, and I since realized it's probably a little too long, so my outlines are a little shorter now. But the key is when you have that outline, and if you need access to that, reach out. We can help you with that. And when you have those course objectives and student learning outcomes, those define the key, what I call ingredients. And my metaphor here, kind of corny, I've been baking more and I'm on a, a, a low carb, no sugar diet. And some of you know, when you, when you bake, baking is already hard enough. And you try to, in fact, banana bread, I just made some banana bread this last week. And it kind of was a, was a gooey mess because I substituted just about everything in here for the non-gluten versions and the non-sugar versions. But I use banana bread here as an example because if, if someone says, make me banana bread or I want to make banana bread and I don't have bananas or I don't have any kind of flour or any kind of rising element like baking powder, baking soda, um, some sort of sweetener, non-sugar or sugar version, maybe some eggs to help there with the keeping it together it's not really banana bread, right? Like it's it's lacking all those ingredients. So those minimum elements that you have are really defined 
in the Title V outline, telling you your topics, and then probably even more importantly, I would say the course objectives and the slows, because those are like, those are the key things that students need to get from this class. So in some ways, you could almost build your class, if it's brand new to you, around those key topics. What are the minimum elements I have to teach? If I have to cut some content, including theories, context cases, what can I cut? And in fact, what's a little funny about Title V outline is, and probably wouldn't publicize this statewide, but there's a lot listed in the course outline part, which is at the end of this video clip, that um, if I had to get to all this information in a cultural anthro class in a quarter, um, there's no way I could do it. I would need probably 20 weeks or 25 weeks. So we trust all faculty out there to say, okay, you're going to adapt and do more of this and less of this. As long as you cover those core areas, then you're fine. If you took a CPR class and you never worked with the CPR mannequin or dummy, um, you know, and that's that's a little different because often those classes are defined by defined by licensing requirements and exams outside of even our college, but. If you don't hit those core components, if you take a business class and you never talk about, um, you know, basic accounting or looking at uh, a budget and how to do a budget on a spreadsheet, it'd be like, well, wait a second, or a film production class and you never get to editing, it'd be like, huh, that that's a film production class or an anthro class. And I never talk about cultural diversity. So for each of those classes, it's often important to define what those minimum areas are that you want to cover. Um, this I, I do sometimes actually in my classes, I'll get uh, note cards. These are actually small note cards that are non-sticky. You can get the sticky version of post-it notes, which we got for the holiday party. I, I guess it was a gift. I thought we were going to use them, but um, this is my set. And you can write you know, those core things you want to do put those on sticky notes. You can color coordinate it. So if you're teaching a class, all the green ones are one main concept or SLO. All the blue ones are another one. And then you can go and start to build these out. Maybe the cards below your topical card at the top would be an assignment or an activity or a film you want to show or some kind of um, you know cool um, interactive activity. So Thinking about chunking your work, about creating a framework is something good in the initial stages of, of creating the class, again, to make sure that you have the minimum ingredients. If you don't have banana, now you could get technical and say, well, what about banana flavor and put that in? But, you know, there's something about the texture of bananas in banana bread that makes it banana bread and not something else. So if you don't have the minimum elements, I think it's really hard to teach an, an effective class. Now, I should say sometimes those minimum elements are defined not only by your Title V outline, your objectives and your slows on that Illumin outline, but it often can be defined by the textbook that you use. This is the textbook we use in sociology. It's free to students. It's an open educational resource. We'll talk about those later. And what's cool about this is because it has a topical outline, I could do some of that chunking of my work or main topics using the outline, or I could match my slows with one of the readings, one of the chapters of readings. So working hand in hand with your Title V outline, connecting that to your slows, connecting that to your, your textbook is, is probably a good approach. Um, and speaking of the textbook, for those of you that are interested, um, we do have open educational resources available. We talk about this a lot. So again, this is the book for sociology. It has online viewing. You can download a PDF and you can buy a hard copy and it has the ISBN. So if you're looking for a new, let me let Carolyn in, if you're looking for a new book for our class, um, you could reach out to me, to Treva. Um, Melanie Chu in the library has done so much with creating a worksheet um, specific to open educational textbooks and resources. So just reach out if you have uh, questions. Now, the other place to look if you want content for a class, it's not just your textbook, but it's really the commons out there. So you can go to what's called Canvas Commons, and it's just found right here in the left-hand navigation menu. You can type in anything in the search bar at the top. Um, if I wanted LTCC resources, these will pop up. If I wanted anthropology resources, I could type in and I get 135 results. I can filter it by most favorite, most downloaded. And then further, I can say, I just want the modules. I just want the assignments or quizzes. Once I do that filtering, and I can filter down here with grade level, just LTCC, 
then it'll likely reduce the number of resources, but it gets it a little more honed in on what maybe I want exactly for my class. If I like this resource that I just found on linguistic anthropology, I could poke around. All I have to do is import or download into my class. And then I have some choices. We could talk about content in importing in Canvas later about what I want to import whenever I import anything in Canvas. So you're not stuck or required to use everything that you find. And keep in mind, you can always um, hide those modules that you import, if they're modules that you're importing, from your students and play around with them. They don't have to you know, go live to your class, even if your class is live. I can also go to the internet and type in cultural anthropology class or film production class or whatever, and I can poke around and say, well, here's an open class on um, from MIT. Is there anything I can use in there or steal, however you want to refer to it? I can also do that on YouTube because YouTube has, has so much great content. So I go to YouTube. Um, you'll see my viewing history here, right? Music. I don't know why The Office is on there. I don't watch The Office. but um, And I type in cultural anthropology, and then I find videos. And all I have to do is click on one of those videos, hit the share button, copy that, and put that right into my module in Canvas. So there's so much great stuff out there to find on the internet, Canvas Commons, on YouTube that you know you can always supplement, particularly if you're rushing to get that class going if it's a new prep. Now, um, and thanks Amber, she said the syllabus resources are, are good and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. The syllabus resources were provided um, uh, not just through me but through many faculty on campus. So when you think about your syllabus, you want to include all of the following typically assignments, due dates, readings, all of your policies that are important, like your behavior policy, academic dishonesty, your policy on late assignments, all of your grading requirements, very key to have those in there, how to um, effectively communicate with the instructor, that's always key, you know, how quickly you'll answer messages from your students. Um, and to show you some of the resources available here, and we'll look at a few areas first, um, this I believe is... Um, yeah, this, so this is the syllabus website, so if you're interested in this, um, I provided the link there. But this has a lot of um, links just talking philosophically about syllables, uh, 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 syllabi, and also it has bits that are collected from your uh, colleagues. For example, what is Christina's academic dishonesty policy? What is my classroom behavior policy? So what you can do is you can look at under grading, um, you know, someone else's policy, cut and paste that and tweak it to your own liking. So again, it's a real encouragement to crowdsource as much as we can information in this case about the syllabus. And I, it's, it's pretty extensive. So take a look at that. Having codes of conduct in there, and these are all available on the syllabus website. Very important. If your students plagiarize, what are the consequences? If you have a challenging student who's acting up, how do you get him or her to behave and, and to warn them before you take disciplinary action. You can also download, it's a very brief template, it may not be useful, but it's very much just kind of the, the, the key areas of a class. And I think Trevor's created some stuff in Canvas as well. There's a lot out there actually that you can use, so you don't have to start from the um, you know very beginning in terms of getting your syllabus ready for um, for your class. And then do go back to Canvas Commons because sometimes you'll find a syllabus in there. You can also click on our um, syllabus resources. And this has a very um, simple, again, that um, sample syllabus and then some of the policies that you can directly using the import button import into your class. So take advantage of that. Um, this is Melanie's work here. I wanted to mention this. This is the library is, is collecting all of the book orders um, which typically Barnes and Noble and the bookstore was doing in the past. They want to make it quicker so that we can help students out, particularly if they need a loaner book, if there's an expensive book. So if you're interested in accessing those resources, um, I don't think, I think you can view it, but I, I don't believe you can edit it. But um, reach out to Melanie Chu and the folks in the library. They've done a great job just collecting all the books that are current for every class, including those open educational resource books. Um, and as we're going through this, like, if is, are there any questions any of you have about a, a syllabus, what to include, how long it should be, uh, the policies, anything that, that you struggle with with creating a syllabus for your class? Go not, ahead, Amber. Not something I struggled with, but something that was really brought to my attention in the last 
you know, nine months, especially since COVID hit, was really thinking about defining everything in your syllabus and what are office hours? Because a student who's unfamiliar right. with college culture is really yep. gonna, gonna struggle and might be overwhelmed by the length of some of our, our syllabi um, and some of mm -hmm. those, those terms that we use very easily and very frequently. Right. Um, but just making sure that you go through and you look at it with kind of um, a different lens and making sure that everything is, is clearly defined for somebody who may not be be familiar with college culture. That's great. Um, and that's a reminder. Maybe I'll uh, reach out to some faculty and just say, hey, do you have a, a way that you define this? Because, yeah, we were talking, I think, in one of our workshops just about um, office hours. And, you know, we schedule these, but have we ever defined office hours? And I, I think all these years I've been teaching, I don't think I've really defined them. And I think that's, again, something we assume, like I, I wouldn't call it an implicit bias, but I would call it like the hidden curriculum where we don't have to define it for ourselves because we you know, made it through school and got our degrees and all that. But for new students, if they're brand new to academic culture, they might say, I don't know what an office hour is. What kind of questions could I ask? So maybe we could collectively create a little blurb that says, an office hour is a time set aside for you to ask questions of your instructor, for example, and then you could give examples of, you know, how do I write my paper? How do I um, prepare for my speech and my speech class and so forth? So I think that's an excellent just indication of how, you know, we could do more to define what each of these components means in our class. Um, so great. Yeah. Um, next, we talk about Canvas creation here. And again, some of this is, I think, old probably to, to everybody here. Uh, cool. Trevor just said creative syllabus, liquid syllabus. Let me, I actually want to see that. That looks good. I've heard of this. Yeah. yeah it's those resources from that one, Scott. And it's just really nice. cool. You actually use a Google site to do it. It's really easy. It, it's a, but it creates this. It's also nice as it creates a, you know, a document that students can access from anywhere as long as they have the URL. So if all of a sudden mm -hmm. the class site goes down or, but it's just a really interesting way to present Kind of who you are and bring that to your syllabus in your life it's there, there's this some really cool things i about i've seen out there um that people are doing i'm actually working on the new one for uh, my class so it's um it just like i said it um i've been seeing it, it's a lot in the humanizing area you know yeah, humanizing good. online um or your really online good. Courses. Humanizing so, the home. yeah so this is um this whenever you see this michelle uh Pacancy brock she's like one of the leading um, folks in the area of you know humanizing she's written about extensively served on a lot of uh, mm -hmm. you know advisory groups and stuff so anyway it, that's just one thing I, like I said that. really <laughs> doing good. using I mean creating your syllabus can be taxing anyway but um, and, and trying to include everything and do all that but it's just again a different way to kind of present yeah it, uh, to student um, to the to your students so yeah, and what's good about it is sometimes, you know, syllabi are really boring looking because they're just text. And if so, having a home page video or something like that, that's really good just to have more of that. Yeah. yeah. No, that's excellent. Um, thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, so in terms, I, I guess in terms of Canvas creation, we can kind of zip through this quickly because I think we're probably pretty familiar, but um, included in here would be, you know, when you first set up your class, Treva always sends out a detailed message about the dates and stuff. And I always read that because I forget, you know, there's two places to put it in to set your start and stop dates. Um, you know, the, the issue on whether students can access the class or not before and after those dates, during, etc. Um, importing from a previous class, we'll look at that in a second. Deciding on, you know, how you're going to teach a particular concept using something in Canvas, I think is key, particularly Friday, if you're interested, attend the uh, Play Posit workshop, because that's a brand new one that's going to, I think, be really cool and interactive for our students. Um, and then all that content organization, taking your files, notes, readings, handouts, and pulling them into a class, which someone had emailed me about recently and it was the reason really to, to do this workshop. So as you think about chunking your work and organizing your work, again, some of that can relate to what your module structure is. That's the way I approach things. If I know week one is going to be maybe chapter one and two of the book, I can put that in there as I make an outline and then I say, um, okay, what activity or lesson would go great or video with whatever topics are covered in my textbook in week one. And then maybe also make a mental note or check this out on a piece of paper or sticky notes of whether or not I'm covering all those objectives, SLOs, 
and the um, the some of the topical areas in the outline of, of record. So in terms of course setup and navigation, I just created a basic class here, a blank class. You know, when we first get a class, there's nothing there. There are the preset tools that you can use and you can customize all this. There isn't a syllabus there, there isn't a module. So at this first point, you could start working, but first thing is, as I said, you wanna go in and adjust all those dates that Treva always lets everyone know about prior to the quarter starting do that in two places and then really go in and think about your navigation which tools are you using if you're not using labster don't have labster appearing on the navigation menu because students will be like what's labster you know you teach anthro but you're not really doing lab simulation so um, and then the next place is to start with modules and when you start with modules again assuming you're not importing a class or other content some of it is very bare bones cutting and pasting um, some of the, the um, how can I say it, the formatting of text in Canvas, sometimes I still get hung up on a little bit where the spacing doesn't work out. So I sometimes save my documents as a rich text uh, RTF document and then cut and paste it in there. You can experiment with that. But having, as Travis said with the humanizing stuff, if you have um, a home page that has navigation menus or a welcome video, that can be a way to humanize that home page or to give students a heads up on here's where you start and that kind of thing. So that's maybe a first place to think about with your settings. Again, if you have a blank shell and you want to import information or content from either Canvas Commons or another class, you can do that on the right hand menu as you all know. And um, again, I could choose what I want to import into Canvas. If I find something really good, I can just import that information um, I can also then do a class import, and I think some of you have probably done this. We typically use the second from the top there, copy a Canvas course. Um, if you taught it in Moodle or something, maybe you would do that. And you can choose for that class what exactly you want Canvas to import. So if I want the entire thing, I could hit all content. If I want just select content, um, I would click that and I actually made an error here once I hit import it'll tell me you first need to select your content before it runs that job and that's where you select the content there and what's nice about that is I could choose to only uh, pull in uh, you know the modules or I could only pull in the exams or whatever you have a lot of choices there in terms of what you can bring in in your canvas class so that hopefully makes some of the work a little bit easier but I always say Kind of like my analogy, teaching in 98 when I had someone who taught before me and they said, you're teaching her books. I said, wow, I, you know, I don't really know how to teach some of the books. And it was a super challenge for me to do that. Unfortunately, the quarter after that, I ordered my own books and, and it was radically different. But even if you get someone else's class, making it your own is, is really important because every class has its own personality based on the readings, the instructor, of course, the modules, the content, the videos. So... I think that's just, just really um, important. Um, this next bit here is just saying that when you think about bringing your class in, you, you might have a bunch of files that you have to bring into Canvas. There isn't a magic tool out there that is, you know, hey Canvas, bring in every single file, make an exam, make modules. This is really kind of tedious work as some of us have found out. So what I do, if I'm teaching my Social 107 class, I open up my Social 107 folder and I will have in there, you know, when I used to teach this in person, let's say, I'll have all my handouts or I guess I said Social 104. Okay, so I'll have all my handouts in there. I will have um, activities. I might have exams and quizzes. So I could begin to work with these. I could say I'm going to take um, my handout for Chapter 2 and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut and paste this into a... Um, uh, a module in Canvas, a page that lives in a module in Canvas. Or, um, I think it was Betsy working in Addiction Studies, she has a lot of um, worksheets. And so these might be PDFs. And so if you have PDFs, you would use maybe the Files tab, upload those as files into Canvas, and then your students and you would access those that way. So there isn't, like, I don't know, uh, Trevor or anyone else, did, like, any other tips on this? Because some of this to me is... It's cutting and pasting, right? There isn't an easy way around taking handouts and getting them into Canvas, right? Really the best practice at this point that's being encouraged by, you know, with the CDC OEI for, you know, creating accessible content 
is really to take the time to copy and paste things into a Canvas page, page. Um, mm-hmm. you know, or even start out where you can even, um, in the rich content editor, there's the little T with an X next to it as one of the buttons, which mm-hmm. eliminates any formatting that you brought in. And then you can kind of start, you can get the, you know, get the text in there at least, and then start, you know, using the, you know, the, um, the different headings and, and those types of things for, it's it because yeah. it's it is about accessibility and as we move forward with our peer online course review and getting classes reviewed to be in the you know in the co- consortium and the and that in the exchange um, and it's super vital is that is that your your content is accessible so when those students who have some type of assistive you know technologies that are you mm-hmm. know screen readers and stuff that they're doing that it it, it seems like it, it okay I don't want to say I don't want to say it seems like a burden. It is a burden mm-hmm. in the sense that if you have a lot of your stuff that you created um, over the years, like, you know, like in Microsoft Word, let's say, you know, I'm sure all of us, when we use Microsoft Word to create our handout that we gave our syllabus to our students the first day of class in a face-to-face class, um, you know, we we would bold text and maybe underline it to draw attention to it. Well, in the world of online, when things are underlined, Students are thinking it's a hyperlink. That's the world we live in. Even if it's not blue, yeah, they're right. and they they're putting their pointer over it, and then they contact you sometimes. I don't know if you've had this. Um, the links on your syllabus aren't working. I remember one of my first syllabi that I transferred in. I'm like, oh, it's because it was my document I created as a hard, you know, a handout. Now doesn't make sense in this world that I'm I'm working in. So it is things like that. But the good thing is, is that you know you can once you get that course or that page built you can easily you know copy it into a new course you can even copy one page now you know if you go into any of your pages and you're in the edit you know look at the three little dots and it'll say send to so you can even send it to a colleague share stuff Mm -hmm. which is great as a page or you could copy to and you select the course and you just get that in but like scott said Mm -hmm. it's i mean it's 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 not an easy lift. I mean, all of the people who are who have taught now the first time online and different things, you you know that this is a huge lift to create yeah. to create this stuff. Yeah. But you know, it um it's well worth it. The students appreciate it. They're you know it's accessible by everyone. You know that you know your students are engaging and participating. You know to the best of their ability by doing mm-hmm. it. Yeah, great tips. And it, it sounds like then like just. Kind of the advice is avoid the PDF files. Now, some of us have readings as PDF and we get into again, and I mentioned in the first workshop today to really talk to Kelly because she knows all this stuff, like how to maybe work on making those. If you have PDFs that are not accessible, that don't work with the screen readers to really reach out to Kelly because they're probably a resource or even people to help you with, with some of that. Again, not all of that. Um, now, the other thing to go along with this, you know, this is just saying, Take, literally taking a Word document, as Travis said, getting it accessible, removing the formatting, the underlying, the colors, all that stuff as a module page. It doesn't mean, though, that any of these documents that I used in my face-to-face version of a 104 class will be relevant to the online. So there's a lot of tweaking that goes on there, too. And that's why it, we never, I think, should underestimate the amount of work that goes into starting a, a class from scratch. Um, in terms of synchronous and, and asynchronous Again, I I created this chart going back uh, to one of the previous workshops, trying to think just like what, you know, what works better in some classes versus other. If you like more synchronous kind of work, obviously you're going to be doing things like Zoom, Cranium Cafe. I have VR headsets on here. We don't really have those, but you could. Live streaming. Marco Polo, I say it's a little more, it's not real time, but it's better than just a... Um, instructor created YouTube in, in a sense because it's more interactive. Marco Polo, there's a delay between the little video clips, but our Spanish faculty have found like students really respond to that app. So as you find apps or other technologies out there that might work for you, you know, just consider what's going to work best for your class, your style, and so forth. And then step four is the Canvas structure. Start to build things out based on all that previous work. So as Trevor got out with the humanizing experience um, video, welcome video, thinking about navigation, making a more humanized syllabus, building out all of these things. Uh, the gradebook typically is self-populated by Canvas from your assignments and your discussion boards, but you might want some formatting work on there just so you know 
how to view. I, I like to change things around a little bit and there are quite a few options. Again, I use the Canvas gradebook more often than I use our Passport one. It's just easier for me to use. Um, and then think about pedagogical approaches. Those go along with assignments to say, well, I want to do workshops or I want to do class presentations. What What is that going to look like? Um, so, you know, all of that work there is really getting into the nitty gritty. So saying, how many assignments do I want? Are they going to be exams? Am I going to assign a paper? Getting into that thing like what percentage of the class is worth, you know, if 30% of the class is, is my paper, 70% maybe is discussions or 40% discussions plus another some percentage of quizzes or something like that. All that kind of work you do initially really does determine a lot of what happens in the class. It'll determine the pace of the class, when your midterm is, when your quizzes are, if you have quizzes, when the paper is due, you might go go ahead and, and tweak some things because of that. Um, I'll let, let me just play this short clip, but then Trevor can talk about the new um, plagiarism detection. I was able, I emailed Trevor about this. Um, it's called SimCheck and on mine, it's showing up, but it's still referred to as turn. Yeah, it should be here in a second. Turn it in, I think. Um, file uploads. Yep, and the, now there's this new plagiarism review tab, and this is where you set your your various settings. Trevi, do you know any more about like how they're yeah, rolling it's, out it's SimCheck? It's kind of odd, Scott, is because the, you know Turnitin has different levels of subs, of subscriptions, mm -hmm. and so Verisite was the kind of the product that you know the CVC was going with when we were in the pilot phase of the of the initiative and then um Verisite obviously was it um it was way less expensive and it was a really good competition with turn it in <laughs> and we love the product it had a lot of good things you know we we're like oh this is going to be great well um the big the you know the big players on the block turn it in purchased Verisite um, bought course, that, yeah. uh, you know, but, um, and so Verisite became a product of Turnitin in which they're calling it SimCheck, but it's now it's under the parent company of Turnitin. So I'm honestly, I, I honestly don't know, Scott, if they're ever going to call it yeah. SimCheck on our stuff. I, yeah, I contacted, I contacted the um, Turnitin group to help and ask them, you know, something they sent me even had a little one time referred to SimCheck and then I would go to our instance and it wasn't there. And so mm -hmm. I think they're struggling yeah. with some, um, you know, rollout stuff. So yeah. it is turn it in is the, yeah. is, you know, overarching is the safe, you know, you'll be I wish they'd pick one name. It's like confer zoom, confer now. And yeah, just pick one, yeah, <laughs> pick one name. Um, but the good news is, you know, regardless, again, when you go to click new assignment, just make sure that you uh, click on this. Um, well, it's, it was on the previous page, but that new plagiarism tab. Um, do you want to exclude bibliography quotes? Do you want to index all the submissions? So that would be good if you're concerned about students sharing papers over time. Back in the old days when, when I was an undergrad, I remember I was at a Big Ten school in Indiana and all the fraternities and sororities would keep um, files back then, you know, it was, it was all the test files and all the handouts from every class. And, and it was a, a perk to join um, a sorority or fraternity because they would give you, you know, access to these files, which I thought was really shady. But um, so this is kind of preventing that if you had a student who took um, a, your class one quarter and they share that paper with another student, having an index, even if they never plagiarized, this will allow um, the machines to check against that. Now, I mentioned this earlier, some civil liberties experts were upset about this and some guy actually sued. It was in Texas. I don't know. Is there is there a stereotype there? But someone, I think it was in Texas, sued um, Turnitin or one of the big companies. I forget which one. And they said, you know, you cannot, it's, it's access to intellectual property. You cannot hold my papers and index them because that is denying me my rights and so forth. And I forget what happened with that. But it's interesting to think about this, you know, and, and I know some faculty have expressed concerns about the civil liberty issues connected with uh, Proctorio and his big brother spying on you and so forth. What what I think we would say, I think Trevor would, would agree with me, it's up to you to use it. It's available. Do you have to use it? No. If you want to use it, you can use it. Um, if you have questions about how to use it, you know, reach out to me or Trevor, but it's not... Um, I, I would say it's very beneficial just because even I have detected plagiarism in discussion posts and you can always use, you can set up a fake assignment, a blank assignment just for yourself. Don't 
publish it. And then you could put discussion posts, cut and paste those into an assignment just to have turn it in or sim check, whatever it is, check to make sure that students are not plagiarizing their discussions. Because I have discovered plagiarized discussions. And the key is, if it sounds like a Wikipedia article, eh, there's a good chance that it might be, right? So I don't know. Anyone else have anything else on that? Yeah, Scott, um, I just had um, somebody contact me about, they wanted, they have essay questions and their quizzes. It's not, you, you mm -hmm. can't turn on the turn it on for your quizzes. But so what I suggested to Ooh, the faculty okay. was I said, you know, you if you have quiz, you know, essay questions, you could just have the students um, you know, they have to, you know, yeah, put the burden on them. I mean, I'm, I'm, it, unless, yeah. you know, there's sometimes where you have to make a document, make that assignment was worth zero points and say, you have to submit mm -hmm. your quiz, your, your quiz um, essay responses. You know, I think they wanted, they like the quiz feature so they could grade individually and stuff. Cause there's some, you know, there's oh, some pluses. Yeah. yeah. There's some pluses to that. Yeah. And so, and again, the student has to check saying, I know that I'm, you know, submitting this, um, according to the college's policy. If a student just re refuses to do that and you've, you know, you've told them that you're going to be using this, it's like any any face-to-face -face class. A student could then say, you know, I'm choosing not to take this instructor for this course. And they can go ahead and right. drop it and take right. a different class. I mean, proctorio, the same right. thing. If they don't want proctored right. exams, again, just make sure it's in your syllabus that you use these tools, that this is what it requires of them. Mm -hmm. They know the expectation and let them make an informed decision. So yeah, that's totally. kind of how you can cover yourself. Yeah. That's really good. Put in the syllabus and that workaround with, um, you know, quiz. The other way is you could just have multiple choice on your quiz and then you could have a separate assignment and call it quiz essay. You know, I, and it adds, it's going to add another place in your grade book, but so what? You can filter your grade book however you like. And that's what I do. So, um, or that's what I would do, I guess, because I, I think, yeah, again, you, you just want that that safety net for yourself and your students to make sure that they know that you're checking for plagiarism. So, yeah, so, you know, reach out with anything else on that. Again, points and percentages, you know, I always start a class trying to figure out how many total points, and then I get into, you know, X percentage, 20% of that will be discussions or 40% will be discussions and try to really work out like, the symmetry or balance in the class to make sure that I cover everything equally based on those percentages. This next step is just saying there's additional components outside of Canvas. Canvas is our go-to LMS learning management system. Trev and I would both probably say it's so much better. I'm not going to mention previous ones, but it, you know, I, I rarely encounter something that I think like that's bad. And when I do, because of that feature where you can submit a, a, a suggestion, if they get enough suggestions, I'll change it kind of like Zoom, I feel like they're always staying on top of things. I didn't even realize today there was a message between me and Treva and a faculty member saying about the, uh, was it the multi-tool? And I said, oh, what is that? And I guess Treva had sent a message out. But stuff happens so quickly in Canvas and in Zoom that I feel like they're totally on top of it. And it's important for us to stay on top of it and figure out like, well, wait, what's this new feature? And the plagiarism is changing. And uh um, and the other thing that's changing is the rich content editor. The, the layout of it is changing a little bit. So a little more to learn, I guess, but it's, these are all typically good changes. Yeah. You're foreshadowing, um, Scott, the new rich content editor. It's the 21st of the month. I was going to <laughs> send oh, nice. out the information that it's going to. Right now, it's been an option for you to turn it on in, yeah. in our course. You, know, you can go to your class and options and you can turn on things. And it was a kind of a beta for the rich content editor, but it's going to, um, it's permanently getting turned on at the end of the oh. month. So I was going to wait till, yeah, not, not that it's five minutes yeah. out. And I was going to share with you, so you, you know, to you that it's like, it's like you said, no, maybe we can do a workshop on exactly. it. Exactly. It's a constant work thing of changing. And it's, I, yeah. I've had it included in the, the LTC users group, you know, but I knew a lot of people weren't using it. Just a, a, a few people come across it and then I get questions or they switch it and, I think I switched it and didn't realize that because yeah, it's showing up in mine. I think it looks better than the old one. Yeah, so kind of a thing when you know when buttons move or they kind of change, it just you know it's just we yeah we're creatures of habit and we we know where things are, but it everything's yeah. there and actually it is enhanced. I think once you get used to using it, so mm -hmm. it's just again take a dig, big <laughs> you're still gonna take a, a big breath. <laughs> Okay, right when you get feel a little comfy, we get we say surprise. We'll, we'll overload you with even more information and new stuff. 
Um, and, and that's what really this is too, because again, if you're a science faculty member, you probably need to know about um, maybe Proctorio, probably for math, which is our tutor, uh, tutoring. It's our, how can I say it? Um, it's our proctoring software, but a lot of people think it's Big Brother because it's it's tracking everything you do. It's locking your, your um, browser down. It's, you know, if you move your head, it kind of detects that. So that would be something that if you want a proctored exam, um, that's important to you and not an open book exam, you'd use that. Actually, I'll go through these slides because they have everything. Um, these others are all, again, additional. These relate to video. Um, there was just a message say Trev and I got about making videos using Canvas Studio. And Canvas Studio, what I like about it is it sits in your class, students can access it, and it's easy. It, it's so much easier than YouTube, you know, because with YouTube, you've got to figure out how to get your videos to YouTube. This is all done on your screen. You can share the video with your students, and it just I think it makes it really easy. Now, Friday, um, attend the training on Play Posit because this is a new, Trev and I did a couple of seminars already with them. Um, it's our new system. I'll just go back to that because it's this is just a video, but um, it's our new system for making um, interactive videos. You can do your own quizzes. I think it's very cool. It does have a, a bit of a learning curve, so I would definitely come to that training Friday because I don't feel totally comfortable <laughs> using it yet. I feel like I, I still have some questions about it. Um, of course, you can always in uh, YouTube, you can get a video, pre-recorded video, share that. You can also, um, uh, with your, um, your own work, of course, if you wanted to, you could create your own YouTube channel. Now, Zoom itself is a video synchronous software technology allows you to do video chats like this but the nice thing is you can save those videos you can always share them so you have like really more than one option you could use canvas studio you could use um, zoom of course we have confer zoom which is very specific to the california community colleges and you could even create your own youtube page um, these other apps again are going to be specific to what you teach so if you don't teach in sciences you're not going to uh, maybe need to use Labster, but Labster is a great simulation software that allows you to create, um, I'll just show you a sample here of the video, create simulations like you would find in a, a you know, a actual laboratory setting. Um, and you get to choose which um, of the simulations you want. You can import those simulations. And then they look very much like um, a first-person shooter game without the shooting. Um, so, you know, it's like you're in the lab and you're touching things virtually and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I was saying to a few people, I was like, wouldn't it be cool if we could do the VR glasses? Because some of the the new games coming out with Oculus glasses, they're they're pretty darn impressive. Like I, I see this as the the future, but I think we have to kind of get on that wave and say, yeah, let's let's investigate some of this and maybe see if we can do virtual um, Oculus class type teaching. Proctorio is your proctoring system. So if you do want a proctored exam, uh, reach out. There's a short demo I did on it. Um, I haven't used it myself, but I know quite a few science and math faculty have used it. Again, I think concerns are more about the privacy issues of what Proctorio is doing. You do um, have the option, though, just like Turnitin or SimCheck, to make sure that you can act on whatever information Proctorio determines for you. It doesn't tell you this student failed or they cheated. They told you there are these anomalies that happen where a student did this. They lucked away for a minute. How do you want to deal with that? And it'll even record um, video of that. So it's a bit big brother, but there's probably no other way to get around that when you think about just making sure that students, you know, don't cheat. Again, additional resources out there. I already mentioned those. You can click on those. The, the last step in this is just what we're probably all doing now is the ongoing work and upkeep. So after you create your Canvas class, you're probably not going to finish every single assignment. You have some of those unpublished, which is great that they have the unpublished feature. So go back and make sure your midterm is done before week five or six publish it and so forth. Um, making those modifications that you you do every quarter when you realize some things worked and some didn't work. And then reaching out to your colleagues, me and Treva, you know, partaking in some of these trainings and, and getting help where applicable because there is help out there. We're trying to build up more of that, but I think a lot of people feel still like you're on your own, you know, you're out in the middle of the ocean on a rowboat <laughs> without any contact with the, with the outside world. And, um, 
there's there's no one to go to for help and hopefully there is there is help for everybody out there so um so some q a or, or questions or challenges you're facing maybe in terms of most of you have taught classes before um i think all of you so just maybe some tips on how you modify a class, even if it's a different class from one quarter, from fall to winter, how do you modify your class in Canvas the next time around? Do you keep the same structure? Do you add new activities? Do you take things out based on success? Is it based on the content you're teaching? Any tips on that? The film production course I'm teaching now is an Eve class, and I did it strictly mm -hmm. as if it were face-to-face. -face. This quarter, I'm actually integrating Canvas discussions and assignments, which I did not do the first quarter. And I think it will be okay. very advantageous to add a digital concept, an online concept to an Eve mm -hmm. class. Even though I treated it face to face, I am going to use Canvas discussions and assignments this quarter to have an mm -hmm. online element to my Eve class. Yeah. It's really like um, that thing in the schedule. You could have the synchronous and asynchronous. So when you do your Zoom, those are real time. And then the discussion boards, they're asynchronous. And I think that's a good idea to try a bit of both because you might have some learners that prefer one versus the other. You know, So why not try out both and see what results you get? Yeah. I mean, there's a side, I think, of every... Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. It's an app for um, their little videos. So like you you record a short video, you know, like TikTok or little videos, uh, they're shorter videos. And then the the next person in your chain can watch your video and then respond to that video. So it's like Zoom, but it's asynchronous, right? But the delay typically is shorter. It's kind of like social media updates if someone write something to you on Instagram or Facebook or shares a photo or video, you know, there might be a delay, but unless you're really inactive in social media, you're, you're probably going to respond, you know, in an hour or two or something like that. So the idea behind Marco Polo for the Spanish faculty was it was a good way for students to practice Spanish skills and they could record these short videos. Is that right, Treva? Is that your understanding? Yeah, yeah. it's kind of like a, a video voicemail is how it was described to me is that you can leave a quick message and then they can watch it at their convenience and respond with a, another recording. So it makes sense for the Spanish faculty um, to be able to have those conversations and work on pronunciation and, and conversational topics um, in a, a video platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know that's that things they used to when they, they, I mean, Spanish was one of our earlier adopters for member online, I mean, Nancy Barkley and, mm -hmm. and, they, and they used to have students she would have students call into her voicemail at the college right. and leave their their recordings and stuff. So Marco Polo now allows that here, you know, hearing mm -hmm. the students, you know, speaking. But the, the other, I'm sure, plus is that you see the face of the student who's speaking too. <laughs> so I guess it's there. Mm -hmm. It's one yeah. way, you know, it's a, yeah. obviously a learning tool, but it's a way to uh, verify, you know, <laughs> you who, well, at least whoever, yeah, whoever sure. Trevor Thomas is, who's presented herself as Trevor, yeah. would be the one who would be continually, yeah. you know, speaking, you know, you would, hopefully that's, you know, the student enrolled in the class, but, you know, yeah. it just, yeah. but it, it does create a really engaging um, back and forth and just a way to check. Students really do. Mm -hmm. um, I've all, I've just heard lots of really good things from, from students who've taken classes that the Spanish classes that use that they, they do mm -hmm. like it. And anything like that, you know, an additional app that maybe works for the subject you're teaching or your style, you know, um, you try it out, share it, you know, with other colleagues if you think it's it's maybe particularly effective because obviously Canvas is great and Zoom is great and Canvas Studio and now uh, Play Pause it, but there's there's so many options out there that you almost have to really limit yourself. And I always say if you're if you're brand new to teaching, just try a few things and don't use every feature in Canvas. The nice thing about Canvas is you don't have to use everything there. I mean, there are so many features that I never use all those, even within the gradebook. Like I don't use all of the features in the gradebook, but I use the ones that work for me. And then the other ones I just don't deal with. So that's the nice thing about it. And what Solange is doing, like testing and piloting something like a discussion board, 
you know, it, it could be great. It could be a disaster. Who knows, right? And so you try it out and see how it works. Modify it as you go or modify it the next quarter. So it's that iterative process of... Um, of teaching that we all do. That's just so important. You know, one okay. thing I, one thing I learned about canvas is that the more you learn about canvas, the more you realize you don't know. There are things that, again, I, a lot of things that I just don't even use or don't even know about. So. And they're always rolling out something new, or like you said, something, yep. you know um, you know, and the other thing is I just always tell faculty is that, you know, I'm teaching, I went to an OER, you know, text in the fall for my, my class. And now I'm going mm -hmm. to a class I haven't never taught online and it's OER. It's these new things this quarter. And so I'm just always super upfront with my students. You know, in my introduction, I tell them, hey, I'm excited about this new opportunity. Like I'm excited telling them it's a new text. It's this and it doesn't cost you anything. However, I, I, I'm going to make, I know I'm going to make some mistakes with things, you know, and I kind of lay it out there and just mm -hmm. let them know that I'm trying new things. I, I want to make the class better. And I think students appreciate that if you, if you, you know, it, yeah. you just, you just, you just give people information and then they're so much more gracious when you, you do like try something and it flops, you know, you just say, oops, you know, Hey, thanks for the feed. You know, I give my anonymous survey and I think, and I tell them, thanks mm -hmm. for that great feedback. I'm going to tweak it next time, but thanks for, you know, it just, I think it's just, it's that idea of you, your students realizing that again, that, you're, you're engaged in your course, you care about it, you're trying to make it the best learning experience and that they, you know, they can have. And so they're always, I find most of the time, they're very gracious with me and they, you know, they impatient. And <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, be honest, just be honest with, you know, that, that stuff we talked about with empathy, hopefully our students are extending empathy to us because uh, our lives are not the same, right? I mean, like no one is, feeling normal. I, I, who could feel normal under these conditions, you know? So, um, but the good news is if there is good news now, right, we see as we leave 2020 behind and enter 2021 is we're all much more pros at zoom and canvas. And now when we do go back in person, it's going to be like, there's going to be no, I mean, in the past, Trevor would be like, Hey, do you want to teach online? I'll never teach online. I, you know, now it's probably going to be the opposite where people will be like, wow, I really like Zoom and I like teaching online. There will be some faculty. I don't know what percentage that say I'll never teach online again if I don't have to. I'm sick of Zoom. But some of us have been saying for years, like, it's it's actually kind of good because it, it gives you flexibility, gives our students flexibility, and you can have meaningful conversations. Even before Zoom, I felt like you could have some really engaging discussions Um even, you know, on par with what you have in a face-to-face -face class, because in a face-to-face -face class, there can be a lot of distractions, people looking out the window when it's snowing or whatever, you know, texting. Um, whereas I feel like with, um, you know, a Canvas class or a Zoom class, hopefully, if their cameras are on, there's some level of engagement there that I, I feel like isn't always there even in a face-to-face. -face, so I think, I think Canvas is brilliant. Canvas is probably mm -hmm. one of the most brilliant educational tools available. It is absolutely brilliant to teach online. I literally have no complaints. Again, it's like, okay, there's a few things that could like, oh, I wish you could do more keyboard shortcuts, but who cares, right? That's not a big, you know, for the most part, it has everything you could possibly need. Like the grade book is way more advanced than I would expect in an LMS. So yeah. No complaints. Now, the only complaint would be the add-ons. You know, people assume like Canvas Studio, a lot of the bells and whistles that make Canvas even better, as Trevor knows, aren't free. So then it's like, oh, well, are we going to pay for those? You know, or are those going to go away? <laughs> so that's the thing. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's when, you know, yeah, yeah, whenever we get something, it's kind of like, well, you know, how long is the college? Will they support it? Will they, I mean, Canvas Studio, we were already buying it. And then all of a sudden the system came out and said, we'll, we'll provide mm -hmm. it you know, the chancellor's office for two years. So um, I think there's things like yeah. that. Like I said, that I think it was, you know, with the online education initiative, which is now CDC, you know, OEI, um, that really did push things forward in the sense that we, that's where Canvas came, the selection of Canvas came out of that. And then the fact that it, it got adopted so quickly, um, you know, system-wide was still, I mean, we just, those of us in the pilot were just blown away by it. We couldn't, Every time, you know, mm -hmm. they, they had hoped to have like, you know, a 50% a by, you know, adoption rate by a certain time. And all of a sudden it was all the colleges coming in. Part of it was to do, it was a great savings. There were, there, there's campuses that were spending 
you know, a half a million dollars on their Blackboard yeah. subscriptions a year. I mean, we, our old one that we had was costing us 25,000. So yeah. some of it was the money, but then once faculty, you know, just got used to using a new thing, like they were Moodle and they didn't want to have to turn, you know, oh, I don't want to have to learn something new. But I think most of the, most of the time now you're getting people that are just super happy with, you know, overall, there's little tweaky things that little things, but they're always yeah. trying to improve it. So there's one last thing I also want to, when Scott was saying about like the tip is that when you're bringing in content from other classes or other instructors, or even your own class, one of those last things you should do, and it's in this, that little, you know, getting ready or last minute mm -hmm. preparation email that I sent out, but, you know, go into that settings and do your validate links, validate your links in your class. Because if you bring in something that the link wasn't, it's, it's linking back to the prior quarter, it's going to give the student an error message. So it's things like that, that you, you know, just kind of helps you, um, you know, that you're not going to get the, you know, 15 emails later on, like that link, wh why can't I see that? What's happening? Is something wrong? And so if you just take a few minutes to validate your links, you know, before you hit mm -hmm. the pu final publish button, I would um, highly suggest faculty, you know, take that step because when you copy stuff in or that kind of thing, it isn't always foolproof that those links or links break, you know, people change their websites all the time and their URLs and all of a sudden you had a great resource and now it's not working. So um, just that's a tip that I could. That's really good. With. And maybe too, the, the student view. And I think you said the student view changed, right? The location. Um, well, it just allows now there's that little icon up in the upper right hand corner that looks like, you know, a pair of glasses um, because you used to have to go back to home or you would have to go to um, yeah. settings, student view. And so mm -hmm. now you can, you can, um, when you're editing a quiz or you're creating a page or you're doing any of that, that you're going to see that little icon up in the right hand corner of the set of glasses. And it's, um, then it allows you to, to do the student, pre, you know, the student view right from that, that page. Cause you know, a lot of times you're in the middle of the module creating something and then it jumps you know, you have to go oh, over, get out of it, hit on yeah. it. And then you'd have to hit your back, yeah. you know, your back button to get back to where you were. So that's kind of nice. You don't lose your- it used um, to be here, right? Yeah. It, there was a here? link that said, yeah, yeah, there was a link there that said student view, or you could go to settings student wow. view, but you always had to come yeah. back to the homepage to do it. It was yeah. just rather, right. it was frustrating. It was just, oh, that's, and again, that's way better. it's the simple things. And this is what Canvas is always doing, which I really do. Yeah. I've always been super- you know, happy with the product and that they're, you know, they're responsive to faculty, they response, they understand what, you know, they're trying to understand what mm -hmm. instructors and teachers need. And then they're making those, right. those right. necessary changes. Cause it's, it's little goofy things like that, where you have to do three or four clicks to go get student view that just, you're just like, what? <laughs> mm -hmm. And there was a, even a time where I put some special JavaScript into our instance so that you could, there used to be a thing up in the right-hand corner. But when they updated one time, it locked it locked it out. We couldn't we that JavaScript wouldn't work anymore, which was frustrating. Mm -hmm. And so, but now they fix it themselves. So, so that's the good yeah. thing. So, yeah. So that's great. That's yeah. so much easier than having yeah. to go there. And like, like you said, is it funny, Scott? It's like front. when we get those little things. Yeah. I feel like I was given a gift. You know what I mean? I'm just like, oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, there's never been an update. I mean, there have been updates I don't use because I don't use, like any of you, I don't use everything in Canvas, but I've never seen something like that where it's like, oh, that's not going to help me. You know, that could really help me. And even if it doesn't, I don't have to pay attention to it. So that's what's cool about Canvas. And I feel like Zoom is doing that now. And I think because of the Zoom bombing and the competition, because so many people launched versions, you know, Google, did, you know, has their version, even Facebook. I think Zoom was forced to do it more because of that competition. They were like, wow, we better get on the security stuff. And the updates in Zoom, I feel like are significant, particularly with um, hearing impaired students and the new spotlighting. I just see that as being so useful potentially in a lot of classes. So I just feel like we're in great shape. And so when we get all back to normal, whenever normal, if there's normal, we will, you know, be so much better prepared and we no longer have to beg people to have a canvas shell or to consider teaching online. Because in the past it was like, man, there's no one full time in the department who wants to teach online. So the deans would have to hire a new faculty member, <laughs> just teach online, which is kind of like, that's probably not how it should work. Right. But anyway, we're beyond that now. So. <laughs> 
Well, it's, it's exciting. Like we said, I mean, the science department, you know, they used to, yep. they were absolutely adamant that they would not be offering, you know, they just felt that their discipline cannot be, you know, effectively mm-hmm. taught online. And now, you know, like, you know, and I don't know how much the, the, some of the classes will go forward, but however, you know, Sean Ryland's like, Hey, wow, I can, with these labsters and this, I can do the chem 101 class in an online and get, you know, when you're worried about enroll, I mean, when you are, you know, concerned about enrollments, yeah, when you're sure. able to pull from the, you know, every, I mean, I'm going to say more than the state of California, but even just, just the community college system, students looking for impacted courses, then you, you know, right. you're going to gain that type of enrollment. I mean, and which is, which is mm-hmm. great, but again, being able to really offer it and feel that you didn't shortchange the students that they yeah. were able to successfully meet you know, the, the, um, the student learning outcomes, they're prepared to move on to their next level class and feeling confident, which I think is super, super exciting as being as a faculty member feeling that I'm, I'm really able to meet those needs, the needs of those students, meet them where they are and, you know, and help them move forward in their educational pursuits. So I think it's, it is super exciting. So. Yeah. You feel hopeful even given COVID and craziness and whether, you know, the president will leave the white house in a few weeks. So, um, I don't know. Yeah. 2020. Um, so anything else, otherwise I know we've gone, <laughs> we've gone a little long and just to mention some of the other things coming up. So, um, th- the next few things I'm doing this week that I'm offering will be just like on a, as needed basis. So tomorrow, last minute help from 11 to 1150. There is the student workshop tomorrow of uh, student forum. Some of you probably be at that, um, that's just to help students guide them taking classes, last minute help on financial aid, that kind of stuff. So I'm I'm leading that from 12 to 2. So our teaching talk will be from 11, 11.50. And then also some open time on Thursday. And I really recommend the Friday training. Trevor will be there. I'll be there. Um, it's the the corporate folks from Play Posit. And again, this is, I feel like it's going to be really cool and interactive for our students. It's making a much more interactive version of a video, including quiz elements. Um, but it does require some like learning on the, on the front end. And I feel like, you know, you do need a training or two. I've signed up for all their trainings and I'm hoping that to figure it out because I'm still a little bit unsure on the features and how it works, but that is happening on Friday at one. So, um, a lot going on this week. And I don't, Trevor, do you have any other announcements on your end from? No, just, I mean, always, like you said, I'm Scott and I, you know, we're, we're here to help and that, you know, reach out to us. We, um, you know, we're, we're so much better off than we were a few years ago in regards to the resources that the college is putting into, you know, online hybrid Eve, all those kinds of things. Um, you know, I really do think that, um, you know, that we can support the faculty. I, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, we can always have more people and more things, but, um, but, you know, we can, you'll, you, people will be supported and they'll get through to us and we'll, we'll be able to get you on your way. Again, don't, I always tell people with, you know, a new class, remember when you prep a new class, sometimes you're a week, you know, one week ahead of the students, you're one chapter ahead of the students. So, you know, just, just pace yourself. It doesn't have to be published all on, you know, day one. Um, You just, you know, you just say, oh, I paced my course and, you know, it's, and so let students know that. So. Um, Scott, just, uh, so you know, um, some of us are going to need granted access to your drive links that you threw in the chat. Um, oh. So I went ahead and clicked that I wanted access. Um, oh. Or you can change the access just, uh, settings. Oh, I thought he just said. Okay, I okay, I'll do. Uh, yeah, let me look into that. I thought I had done that already. That's weird. Okay. No, you're probably right. I probably just yeah. I'll I'll look into that when we log off. Sorry about that. Yeah. I guess, I guess there's another thing. So what I'm noticing among our dual teachers is I think that many of them are feeling insecure about their ability to offer a course that they feel meets their former face-to-face, like, you know, rigor Uh, and preparedness, especially in CTE, but even altogether, um, they seem to be kind of struggling with it. How would you respond to them? Would, I mean, about what to, about what to add and what they can do? I guess I would say, I mean, that I've, I've heard that not, not just from CTE, but from some CTE. And I would say that, you know, 
as long as you can confidently offer what you have to offer, because a lot of those folks are under those, you know, licensure um, agreements and they're accredited separately from our college and they have to take those exams. Like as long as you can do whatever you need to do um, effectively, you know, do your best with the tools you have. Now, if you discover that 75% of your class, you absolutely cannot teach it using anything through Canvas or Zoom, then I guess that would be reaching out to the dean like Brad and saying, hey, look, this is not going to work. Um, Trevor, what, what would you advise? I mean, that's that's great advice. I mean, the, the, it, the thing of it is, is that, yes, online, I think so many things can be offered online or in a hybrid. But, you know, there may be certain classes that it is just, I mean, like they're talking, I mean, the fire science stuff, they're having to have the you know, or wilderness. I mean, they're having to come together because they have to demonstrate these skills in a group setting. And, you know, the person to person is how they're going to be saving a life on the mountain. I mean, they've got to be doing, you know, it's again, it's related to those student learning outcomes that this skill set is not, doesn't take place in, you know, someone, you know, they don't have a virtual, you know, avalanche, you know, I mean, there's a and snow on a mountain is actually, you know, burying people. So there, I mean, there's, there's things like that, I think, and then that those conversations need to happen where, you know, the curriculum committee, ultimately, that's why they, they require a separate, you know, distance education addendum, which is that document that says this class can be presented and with equivalent information, it's not the same experience, it's the equivalency of, you know, what they would experience in a face-to-face class. And so, um, that's why, you know, those DE addendums, we look at things and, you know, if a faculty member turns that in and they're not having any type of, let's say that they don't have any, appears to have any student to student contact or where's the instructor to student contact, there's no discussions, there are no interactions from the students. We either, you know, try to find out kind of why, maybe it was an oversight or, you know, maybe the faculty says, well, no, that can't happen in this setting. And, and that's where the college needs to make those, the, I want to say the right or the, 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 you know, the correct decision to say, there may be some classes we do not offer online because truly it hurts yeah. the students. And, and then that, that can happen. And that is a, you know, a thing where you can talk with the Dean. Um, if, I mean, I don't know how it is that, you know, if, I mean, the curriculum committee, you know, when you, cause you still, even as a faculty, someone goes and presents the curriculum to the committee to explain and answer questions. And if the committee truly feels that, you know, that's, it's not, a viable mm-hmm. option, then yeah. it doesn't have, every class does not have to be offered online or hybrid. And maybe both of those don't work. I don't, you know, so I know that's tough for some people they are getting, I think people get pressure, you know, I don't think it's always just our, our campus. I, I'm hearing this throughout the state of colleges, you know, trying to figure out for FTS, for all different kinds of things for accessibility. I mean, it is wonderful because it does open up. We've realized that people who never could have taken certain classes maybe have finally got access to, you know, maybe that last, like I said, a chemistry class or something that's going to get them to move on to, they're a nursing student or hope to be transferring, you know, so there is some really exciting things happening. However, there may just be instances where it's just not, you know, the right thing to do. I mean, fundamentally. (laughs) I was thinking of two examples of that, like CPR would be one where I'd be like, no one would have a CPR dummy at home. But culinary, I, I was thinking, could be interesting. Now, again, some of this, it's not just like the level of curriculum, but it's like student access. So like if you said to students, we're going to do a virtual culinary class and I expect you to have a little setup. We kind of did this at the holiday party where we made little drinks and stuff. I actually thought it was cool and fun. I don't know. Maybe I'm my mind's blown because of COVID, but I, I found it interactive and interesting. So you could do that, but then what if a student doesn't have the right camera set up? Can they get their camera set up in a way that they can, the instructor can view what they're doing? Like if they're chopping, you know, a mirepoix, celery, carrots, and, and onion or something on a cutting board, you know, that's where it becomes a one, one-to-one sort of issue with the student and the technology. But I feel like you could almost make a list based on like equipment need or like Travis said, Avalanche, you can't do avalanche virtually. That's ridiculous. You could do the safety components and say, here's a video, watch this. But to actually get into the nitty gritty or like if we we don't do a lot of like automotive or plumbing, but any of that stuff would have to be totally hands on. You couldn't do automotive repair virtually, right? Because even with a simulation, it's not going to be anything like, you know, 
leaking car fluids on your face versus, you know, a little simulation. So I don't want to say it's obvious, but I feel like it, it almost falls into certain categories, right? A lot of equipment, a lot of outdoorsy stuff you really probably can't do all virtually. You can do some virtually, not 100%, though. So Yeah, that's what they were going to be doing. Some of those intro chemistry were almost like things that you could get at the regular store to, you know, to do your experiments. But again, yeah. that could be an accessibility. I mean, like Scott said, you could have students that if they've got to go and, and buy all that, you know, that those things themselves. I mean, when, you know, we're already looking at food insecurities, a lot of different people mm -hmm. not being able to, you know, have the resources that, you, you know, you could have a student that's not going to go buy something like, you know, even if it is things they can buy at their local supermarket, if they need to buy their groceries for the week. So they're, they're just, I think we just need to always be really aware of what we're doing, what we're requiring yeah. of students, why we're, well, you know, why we are, I mean, we're, we all know that this is just a, you know, obviously unprecedented <laughs> times that what we're doing now, just trying to at least get, you know, bring, you know, yeah. the opportunity for students, but in the long term, I don't know if it'll, some things will continue the way they, I mean, online or they may because they found a way to do it now. So, yeah, and I would say too, um, just like if you know, if you know that you could always send those instructors our way and say, hey, talk to Scott or Trevor because there might be a way of doing something some way that maybe you, you hadn't thought of. Um, again, if it's video, I feel pretty comfortable, like from the instructor's standpoint, they could do it. Again, the student standpoint, you know, video sometimes is not not a an assumption we should make that students all have a phone or whatever. But you know, if it's something else, a simulation like a lobster thing, then that gets into is there a game or some app out there for that? We could help them find that, but there's no guarantee, right? Because not everything's available, even though there is a lot out there. So, so oh, cool. Um, okay, well, we went a little over, so thanks for staying. So we'll um, call it there again uh, tomorrow. Law, see some of you for help at 11 or maybe the student workshop at noon. So thank you all for attending today. Yeah. And good luck. All right. Stay safe. <laughs>